Welcome back to the i427 garage, everybody. We are working today on the King's Cobra, and I'm really pushing forward to try to get this car to first start. So I've got a couple of little things I'm working on. I'm working on some panels for the firewall, and I want to get those kind of taken care of. I also want to do some of the electric behind the dash, but uh, I also want to get the cooling system all finished up and ready so that we can start putting coolant in. So that's going to require getting the radiator at the proper angle and getting it all kind of tightened in place, getting all the hoses reconnected and getting that portion of the engine ready to go when we do first start. So as far as the firewall goes, the main firewall piece is, has been in for some time. What I did last night before I went in for the evening is I made a couple of panels. I made a panel that's going to close off this area right here. Factory 5 does not give you this piece. Um, I have a template that I use to make a piece that fits there. And we're going to put our headlight switch and most likely our hazard or emergency flashers switch in this location right here and that'll help clean up the dash on the other side of the car what i've done is i've fashioned a new firewall extension and for this reason so i, I made this piece right here and i have a template for this as well the owner attended the build school and he was instructed to cut this at this angle right here kind of with this swoop in it and um, I, 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 I don't know why the, um, the, the, the actual arm for the windshield comes down through here and you're gonna see on the new piece I have a groove that's much deeper right here so there's less interference with that but um, in, in the 20 plus years that I've been building these cars never once have I ever trimmed this panel in order to make the body fit and uh, I can even show you in uh, Slytherin as an example, even though Slytherin's a Mark III, the contour of the body in this area has remained the same. And there's no interference. This, this, this panel does not hold the body up. So the, the, the reason for cutting this panel kind of escapes me. I don't know why the build school is instructing you to do this. Don't do this. If any panels on your car need to be trimmed, let your body and paint person take care of it because what you're going to end up with if there's a gap here there's a lot of air that's going to be forced up through this area from the engine bay and if you have a big gap here all that hot air in the summertime is just going to come in and end up in the lap of the passenger and that's that's not a good thing um, in the in the winter time if you're driving in inclement weather and it's cold outside it's nice to have the warm air going into your lap but you know for that you probably ought to get a heater so we're going to replace this piece. We're going to put a piece in that is the exact same size as the piece that came from Factory 5. One advantage is it won't have the hole to have to block off in it right here that this one does. So it'll just be a solid piece. But um, I did manage to get it made out of a piece that's already powder coated, actually on both sides of the car. And the way I did that is I took the panel that we cut out right here and uh, I saved it and I was able by using the stomp shear and the Beverly shear I was able to cut out pieces from templates that I have so I have a number of templates this this right here is a template for that piece on the driver's side that we use um, this is another one this is just another design I did this is the one that I've been using most recently and then of course this is the firewall extension template that I use for the passenger side. So I have all of these templates available for use when I build a car because I've gotten cars where this piece has been misplaced or we simply don't want a, you know, a gaping hole in it and the closeout panel has been lost. So having something like this 
in a shop like, like ours, where we're doing these quite often, is really helpful because we don't have to make a new template or make a new piece each time. We can just take this, trace it out on the piece we're gonna use, and then make a new piece. So those pieces are going to be going in here shortly, but I wanted to go to the front of the car and show you what we're gonna to do to correct or set the angle of the radiator in the front. So I put the radiator back in at the same angle the car owner had placed it when he originally put the radiator in. And to, to the naked eye, it looks like it's perfect. Let's just say you're using a one piece aluminum front like uh, from us or from uh, Mike Everson. The um, angle at which Mike, for instance, have you, has you said it, and I don't remember what it is, but let's just say arbitrarily it's 37 degrees. So you stick your digital angle finder on the radiator and you get it to 37 degrees. But then you have to account for whatever angle the car is sitting at. You know, have you done your ride height? Have you done a corner weighting on the car? Are you sure the car is sitting level? So all these things have variables built into them that aren't very reliable when you're building the car from scratch because there's no telling what the angle might be because you don't know what the angle is that the car is sitting at to start with. So what I've always done from the first car I ever did was I used the sheet metal, the aluminum that Factory 5 set, sends with the kit. And although we aren't gonna be using this on this car anyway, it still gives you the opportunity to use it to set the angle. So if you look right here, these two notches are designed to be right behind these two mounting holes for the quick jacks or the bumpers in the front. And as you can see, we're sitting high. So the angle of the radiator has to be pushed down. So basically when this matches up with the back of those two holes, you've got your angle set. Now that's not to say it's perfect. You know, nothing is in this world is ever perfect. So you may have to do some adjustment. So, for instance, our template for the one-piece nose aluminum is purposely made a little bit big so that regardless of whose radiator you have in there, whether it's a donor radiator, which may be a single core radiator, or a three or four core radiator that you had custom made or you've bought from Factory 5, it's going to allow for all that and then you can trim the aluminum piece to fit. Now with this one, we have both the adjustable upper and lower mounts. So when you trim it and fit it, once the body's on the car, what you can do is you can actually take the lower mount and loosen it so that the radiator pushes down on the bottom and gives you more room to get the one piece of aluminum in and then bring it back up into place. Um, you don't want that aluminum in place when you try to mount the body. You can do it, but in most cases, you're gonna either bend up the aluminum as you're trying to place it, place the body back on the car, or you're gonna have fitment issues at the back of the car where you're trying to get it around the aluminum that makes up the trunk. So it's best to have that off when you fit the body of the car and put it in after everything's said and done. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna get the camera set up, I'm gonna go ahead and get that angle set, and uh, at the same time, I'll probably bring you guys back and show you the progress that I've made on the panels for the dash or the panels for the firewall. All right, so we loosened up the bolts for the bottom mount on either side. You probably saw the radiator move down a little bit and so then we're going to fit this piece in here and we're just going to raise it up until those two notches line up with those two holes the best they can so that's going to be about it so basically i've taken the top and the bottom of the center section and lined them up with those two holes now i'm going to go ahead i'm going to tighten the bolts on this side because they're going to be easier to get to since I'm standing right here and I can hold it in place. And then I'll tighten the other side and then I'll recheck it just to make sure it's in the same spot and hasn't moved.
pretty good. So I'm going to tighten the bolts on this side. Which should be good. It's not important to check both sides because the radiator is solid enough that it's not going to want to move independently on each side. It's going to hold pretty firm. So once you set one side, the other side is going to be close or where you know close to where it needs to be and then when you're trimming your one piece front aluminum you can make adjustments in your trimming in order to make it fit a little bit better side to side so we've got it set now we're going to go ahead and uh, start buttoning up all the cooling lines so all the clamps that i've previously left off because we were waiting to do this they can all go on um, and then we'll make sure that every clamp for every hose that we've either put on or changed is going to be tight for first start and adding coolant to the system. All right, it is already the next night and uh, I can show you, I got uh, the angle set on the radiator, so that's all ready to go. I haven't gotten around to taking care of all the cooling hoses. I got sidetracked with the panels for both dash extensions the one on the driver's side and the one on the passenger side so i went ahead and added some protection to the radiator um, up till this point you know i've just been really careful around the car but as you can see the blue tape ain't what it used to be it doesn't like to stick and uh, that'll keep anything from damaging the core of the radiator while we're completing the build and then over here i did finish up this panel yesterday um, tonight what I did was I drilled for the headlight switch and I drilled for our hazard light switch and then I went ahead and I put two of the trim screws that factory 5 supplies with the kit in there to hold the panel in but I think I'm gonna talk it over with the with the car owner but I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna change these out to stainless steel screws and stainless steel washers I just think it'll blend in better and then um, so if you don't know this, this is an area that the, the, the bottom of the dash is open and in, in the driver's seat, it's a very intuitive space to just reach up and mount for the headlight switch. It's easy to get to and uh, it keeps the dash just so much cleaner than having a bunch of switches on it. I know there's guys out there that just love those aircraft quality switches with a little flip colors and stuff. I'm not into that. I like, I like the, the the dash to be clean i mean if i could get away without putting the ignition switch on the face of the dash i would but as you as you know the factory five dashes usually come pre-punched for the ignition switch and so you're kind of forced to put it there um regardless this is the this is the panel all finished up we've got the headlight wiring into the headlight switch but I uh, dieted out in the dash harness these three wires for the hazard light switch and what I'm going to do is I'm going to intercept them over on the connector right here that those dash harness wires tied into and uh, I've got the completed dash harness over here so you can see we organized everything kind of to where it's going to go so everything in this bunch here is all going to gauges. So even these two loose wires right here that I've got, they're gonna to go to the, um, the volt gauge. And then all the, all the wires over here are for other purposes. So we've got the indicator lights that are, go that are in the speedometer over here. So the high beam indicator and the right and left turn signal indicators, those are right here. And then we've got some others over here. We've got uh, power for the dash lights, We've got 12 volt source for the, um, the speedometer because it has a memory for it. We've got a gauge feed, so the speedometer needs a constant power for that as well. Um, and so all that stuff is over here and I think I even have a, 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 a spare ground. So I cleaned up everything in that harness that we didn't need. Any, any stuff that was like a carryover from like the auto meter gauges that Factory 5 um, supplies I think they still supply those in the base kit. All that stuff we didn't need, I pulled out of there. And then um, I did finish the other side. I got it all siliconed and 
pop rivet it back in and you can just you can see over here just how deep we make this cut for the windshield um, you want your windshield to go in without resting on top of this panel and um, I'm not sure I'm not sure if that's the end goal um, you know on the advice that the build school is giving I you know they don't they don't put a finished body on, on the car and I, you know I don't I, I don't know what you know what the circumstances are but I will tell you that in all the years that I built these cars I've never once had Jeff Miller trim this panel it, it, it always just seems to go on just fine and in Slytherin it it went in full you know full size and there's even bulb seal on top of it so the body hasn't changed that much in configuration between the Mark IV and the Mark III before it that this panel changed and there's really no need to cut it so leave it alone and if it has to be cut let your painter do it you know whoever's doing your paint and body let them trim it that way you don't trim it inadvertently ahead of time and then have this gaping hole um, between the body and the panel that you're letting you know hotter or uh, air in general into the cockpit you know it's an open roadster but at the same time you know when it when it's 100 degrees out and you you have uh, engine heat you know that's close to 200 degrees blowing in your lap or blowing in your face that's not a good thing so leave it alone and uh, put it in as it's supplied and let your painter and your bodywork guy determine whether or not any of those panels need to be trimmed so i'll be back out here tomorrow night uh, i think i'm going to continue working on some of the wiring and uh, i'll show you I'll show you where those wires for the hazard light switch. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tie the horn in in that same location and a couple of other little things, the turn signal wiring will tie into that location and uh, it'll make it easier when you wire your dash. There'll be less stuff for you to have to pull apart if you're using you know, an aftermarket turn signal switch from us or the other guy. So in the end it'll make it easier that you know for you to pull your dash out if you have to later in the future we'll see you tomorrow night all right next evening everyone and i told you i would bring you back and show you where i'm tying all of those wires into that we um that we cut out of the dash harness and uh basically it's just on the other side of the connector but i'll show you where now you can deep in all of these connectors and I could do that I have all the tools to deep in the connectors and just leave the the blank spaces open in the connectors but what I've found is that there might be a time in the future where you want to use that pass-through and keep that uh, that whole dash you know to where it's disconnectable so you can disconnect the the, uh, the, the, the connectors and you know pull the dash out of the car and so it, it, if you depin it and you have to add something later now you've got to either repin those connectors or you've got to add a second connector in order to keep it all you know able to separate so what i'm doing right here is um i've got the the pink wire coming down from where we've relocated our hazard light switch and you can see i've i've cut the wires and yes there are two wires because there are two different spots to tie these wires in remember this is a universal harness for both the hot rod and 35 pickup and the mark IV and the gen uh, the uh, type 65 coupe so they go to the dash and they also go to that connector now this customer when he started the wire and chose not to die it out that secondary connector for the hot rod and the 35 pickup it's actually right in here Let's see if i can grab it it's right here so we're going to leave it there but uh, when you start pulling some of these wires out and you're going, what? there's only one wire coming in from one side and there's two wires going out on the back side, that's why. It's the same thing with the horn connector because I've, I've bypassed the horn wire right here because we're going to take it over to our turn signal switch. And you can see there are two wires that my one wire are connecting to. And that's because one goes rec directly to the horn relay. The other side of this goes to that harness that I just showed you that's tucked up inside the foot box. So know that going in before you start dieting out um, some of these wires or relocating them. And then what we'll do is we'll bend these over and then we'll put some heat, sh heat shrink over the top of them and that'll keep them nice and secure so that, uh, you know, there's no power going through these, but it'll just help to keep everything nice and neat. Now we're also going to have to tie into the um, turn signal wires and we're probably going to do that. That's these 
bunch of wires here the whites the blues the yellows and the greens um, we've got the blue and the green right here that go to our hazard light switch so that means we're going to use the white and what the hell was the other color the white and the yellows the white and the yellows go to the back of the car so we'll tie the white and the yellows onto our turn signal switch and then what we're going to have to do is we're actually going to have to intercept the wires that go to the back of the car for the turn signals because this one has the rectangular Cobra Lucas style um, rear taillights and so to isolate those we're going to have to run it through a trailer converter now I, I peeked in the box that came with this kit and it's the um, which one is it it's the Hopkins or Hoppy trail light converter and if you guys remember on the prototype that uh, we sent out to Texas that one came with that same converter and it while it worked fine for the turn signals every time we hit the hazard light switch it, would, it just wouldn't work and so we um, basically threw that one in the garbage and then we ordered a Takansha trailer light converter and all our problems went away so I'm going to urge this car owner to order that Takansha as well. We'll put that in line with some uh, weather pack connectors and it should work perfectly just like the last car. Now we could do, you know, multiple relays like we used to do, but honestly it's more work. Now that we've got a reliable way to do this using this Takansha um, trailer light converter, I mean it's a piece of cake. All the, all the wires are labeled. You just kind of tie them in and uh, put uh, your weather pack connectors in and you're done. So a lot easier to do. So I think that's the route we're going to go. I think that's going to do it for this video. I will catch you up on the next video as far as where I'm at with the wiring. And then uh, I'd like to get the dash. I'd like to get the dash in the car for first start, but it's by no means, you know, a necessity because we have other ways to uh, monitor the, the oil pressure and stuff like that. But uh, I got to still work on getting all of the cooling tubes. Um, tied into the radiator and any other you know radiator hoses or anything else that we that we pulled loose get those connected and then I've got to have the uh, car owner order us some fluid so we can get some fluid in this thing before first start as well so if you're enjoying the content here as always please do the like the share the subscribe all that kind of stuff we'll see you next time have a great day